one. All right, we're going live. Okay, everyone, so as, you, as you're joining us, if you can tell us your name, um, tell us where you're coming from, and we'll, uh, we'll get going. So it'd be good to know where everyone is. I'm, I'm in Brisbane, Australia. It's 6.30 a.m. here in Brisbane, and that is on May the 3rd. So greetings from the future. Okay, everyone, so as, you, as oh, you're joining us, if you there can you tell go. us. We're live on Facebook. That is working now. So yes, yeah, so greetings from the future. I will help you predict any scores, any news or information you need to know. Phil, where are you, from, where are you calling in from today? I am in San Diego, where it's always mm. sunny. Woo exactly. Um, yeah. Nice. Well, I'll leave it there, Phil. <laughs> I'll so we got, do an introduction in a minute. So I'll... Yeah, exactly. Hey, we got um, Wilma from Orange County. Hey, Wilma, how are you doing? And we've got Sarah Jane from Ontario in Canada. Hello, everybody. Well, like I said, it's, it's always sunny in Brisbane. It's pretty warm here today. It's even at 6.30 in the morning. It's sunny in San Diego. I'm guessing it's warm and sunny in Orange County. Sarah, is it warm and sunny in, in Ontario, Canada, or is it still pretty cold? Hmm. All right. So a couple more minutes. We'll be getting going, showing shortly in about one minute's time. Just like waiting for the next few people to join us and also for people to join us live on Facebook too. So bear with us as we go on to today's webinar, how to become the ultimate everyday athlete. You can feel free to join me in some cervical spine mobility as we wait for another 60 seconds for everyone to come. What are you doing with your eyes? We promise you he's, he's not looking weird. He is just doing this generally for his own I cervical health, time. spine health. Awesome. Also, if you could very kindly comment, um, let us know if you can hear us clearly. Is, is the voice, is the sound coming through clearly? Can you see the screens? Just let us know that everything's okay, everything's because we are recording everything. The last thing we want is for us to talk for an hour and nobody to hear us. A-OK -okay from Wilma, that's great. Um, if you are on Facebook and watching us live on Facebook now, give us a big hello in the comments. Feel free to share it with people. We'd love to see uh, people watch us and learn from us today as well. Um, and But bear with us if we do have any questions. Um, we may take a little bit while in getting to you uh, from the software that we're using. Uh, speaking of questions, for those on the webinar software, um, what I'd like you to do is have get yourself familiar with the, with, the, with the system. If you see at the very bottom, there's a Q&A section. If at any point you have any questions, if you could put the questions into the Q&A section and not the chat room, what I can have then is a big list of things to make sure that we answer your questions and make sure that they're um, fully answered to the best of our ability. All right. Okay, Phil, I think we're ready to go. I think we've given everyone ample time now to join us, on both on Facebook and on the webinar. So, greetings. Yeah. Welcome to another Strength Matters webinar series. Yeah. Uh, really pleased to have everyone here join us today. Uh, really excited to do, to do this. Um, this is the second one we're doing this. Uh, last week, we did a similar version of this webinar, but by popular demand and by people wanting more answers and more questions to what we were talking about, We've gone back into this webinar, recreated it, gone more in depth on certain things and cut a few things out to share them for another time for another set of webinars coming over the coming months. I'm going to pass you over to Phil. Um, I'm here, your host. I'm James. Hello. I'm going to host everything today and make sure I can facilitate any questions that you have and make sure you have the best learning experience possible. So, Phil, how to become the ultimate everyday athlete. Over to you. Thank you, James. Hello everyone, thanks for joining us. I'm here in San Diego and I'm going to talk for about uh, maybe 45 minutes tops, uh, just going into a few things today. Um, so you will learn exactly who and what the everyday athlete is. Like James said, we've been doing this, we've been covering this in a lot of blogs and everything, but this is the, the everyday athlete is uh, where Strength Matters is going for the next foreseeable future. Um, so we just need to define exactly who and what the everyday athlete is. Um, we are going to go over the components that make up complete athleticism. We're going to let you know how to identify your own weaknesses within that whole frame of athleticism. And going to let you know how your body moves. Um, and on the back of that, if you stick with us, stick with us till the end, you will receive... Uh, in, it's just kind of my opinion, the best high value daily movements that you can work into your everyday life. And you'll 
you'll also find my opinion of the best bang for buck exercises that translate to you know to, that translate to everyday activities as well um let's say for instance um some things you exercise with only make you better at that one thing i've kind of come up with a little list that if you just do these few things then that helps you get better at everything uh, so before we go into it um just a little bit about who i am so you know who this person is standing in your little two-dimensional screen um i recently moved to san diego with my lovely wife casey who is the editor of the strength matters magazine Ooh. that's us standing on top of the of a local mountain with henry of cambridge my little french bulldog um how did we get here well we, we moved here in november we took a seven day transatlantic cruise from um southampton um 2005 to 2011 so the, kind of that pretty much what defines me i think still consider myself a royal marines commando it's hard to get out of my system I used to spend a lot of time dressing up as a royal marines commando as you can see there <laughs> Um, left the Royal Marines in 2011 because I met my lovely wife and became a self-employed health therapist, uh, movement therapist, sports and remedial massage therapist and personal trainer in London. The first two years of that period were the hardest two, year, two working years of my life. I'd rather go through Royal Marines training twice than have to go through that again. Um, the, during that six six year period, went back to triathlon. I did a ton of triathlon when I was younger. And um, in the top right corner there, that's me sitting on top of Penny Van, which is the highest peak in South Wales. Penny Van is notoriously known as the place where the special forces, UK special forces, do their selection. As one of my little side projects in London, I formed a company called Mountain Ninja Race, which comprised of myself and about five other Marines. And we would try and um, kind of simulate that um, hills phase of the Special Forces selection. Um, we get people traveling down from London and basically give them a complete annihilation over the hills. Um, and they loved it, it was great, but here we go. It's a, Phil, just, just going back on that, it's, it is worth people just checking out. It's obviously just, just to say, if anyone, no one knows already that both me and Phil are from Wales, so we're very patriotic and very proud of being Welsh. And that is, you know, it is a world famous um, course for people who do want to find out more. Just, just Google SAS selection route and you should be able to find uh, more information about that. It's, 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 a, it's a set of hills and mountains in South Wales. It's yeah. very challenging and there's, it's, it is becoming quite more and more famous worldwide. Yeah, um, and it is, it is interesting because me and Phil have spoken about this a number of times. The different styles of training between military and fitness around the world. And um, Phil, I'll let you explain what your what your experiences are compared to the U.S. military compared to the to British levels of fitness and the different styles. Not saying one is better than the other, mm -hmm. but one is. But you know, there's different styles of fitness from both sides. We're trying to give an idea and overview of what we think it is. Okay, it's going well. Yeah, this is going slightly off off course, but um, this is just my opinion from having been on, off on operations in Afghanistan and worked with Canadians, Americans, armies from all over the world, kind of um, against Taliban and um, yeah, local drug lords. Um, my opinion of the differences between the U.S. and U.K. Just to answer James's question is. Generally speaking, this is very broadly speaking, UK are a lot better conditioned. We have a much higher capacity for endurance, much higher capacity for cardiovascular fitness. Um, a lot of the work we do when we go out on the ground in Afghan is, is a lot of um, kind of, we carry everything on our backs and we walk for tens, hundreds of miles and do all of our operating on the ground. This is probably partly to do with the American culture of driving. Um, there's very few places in the whole of America that is a walking community. Everybody drives everywhere. And that's kind of the same when you go to Afghan, they'll turn up, the, the Americans will turn up with their tons and tons of vehicles that will get over any terrain. So 
they got a much higher budget than we do as well. As a result, the US Marines, in my opinion, are kind of nowhere near as fit as we are, but they're, they're much stronger. There, there's a huge emphasis on strength um, within the US military. Um, you know, whenever we went into any USMC gym or any kind of you know, US Ranger gym or any American gym, we'd be like the smallest, weakest one. Um, so, and that's kind of the same seeing American gyms over here in San Diego as well. People are so strong, it's unbelievable. Um, but I also see the other side of it. You ask them to, you know, I see a lot of people getting out of breath walking upstairs just because people don't walk anywhere everyone drives everywhere anyway um I, I, sorry I, I know it's slightly off topic but i think it's it's a, it's a key thing to talk about just from our own experiences and what we've seen and what we um, talk about and this is what we're talking about becoming the everyday athlete which we're going to talk about but here it's about complete fitness it's about total fitness and yeah. there are all over the world there are different strengths like i said you know that does you know, we we find that america you know, compare america to the uk in general we find americans are a lot stronger because of the lifestyle, I think, in the UK and the culture of walking and, you know, doing a lot more of like what you just said is a, is a different style of fitness. And what I think is, is there's a hybrid hybrid system that we can create. And that's what we're trying to do with the everyday athlete is like get the best bits of both world, put them together in a great system that everyone can benefit from. Anyway, off tangent completely. Yeah. I, sprung, I sprung that on you, Phil. I do no, apologize. Good to talk about that. I, I love talking about that sort of thing, and it's um, I'd like to help people leaving the military on both sides because we all have the same problems. Anyway, that's a, so we're going way off track. Right, back to um, back to normal, back to track again. So, people who exercise. I drew these statistics from a number of government websites in the UK and the US combined, and this is what I came up with that approximately 60% of the US and the UK adults between the age of 16 and 64 are completely sedentary. Approximately half of those, so 30% of the whole population, have intention to do exercise, but they don't really do anything. 20% of the entire population do a little bit of exercise, but not enough to be classed as enough as the government are concerned. And it's the 20%, one in five adults do enough exercise. And when I say enough, um, that's just enough in the eyes of the website that I found the information on. It's kind of government guidelines. So that is normally something to the tune of a total of two hours walking every week, two resistance-based exercise sessions. And um, I think that's pretty much it to, to be classed as enough. Putting, putting things into perspective, we'd like to what you know, 60% of the of the US and UK population. So if we just look at the US alone, the population of the US is something along the lines of 320 million people. That was what, roughly what the consensus said last time. 320 million people, 60%. So what have we got there? We've got about 160, you know, 170 to 180 million people who are completely sedentary in the US. That's in the US alone. We're not talking about the rest of the world, we're talking about the US alone. That's a significant number of people who are sedentary. And this is what we're trying to get the message out across is that we need to start thinking about how we work with these people and get them away from being sedentary into getting enough exercise and get them training for a healthier, more active lifestyle. Yeah. Thanks, Phil. Yeah, Good. moving on. So what is an athlete? If I said the word athlete to most people walking on the street, I said, close your eyes and describe a picture of an athlete, it would be this type of thing, right? You're thinking kind of sports, track, sprinting, Usain Bolt, that sort of thing. Um, so let's just look at the definition of an athlete. A person who is skilled or trained in exercise, sports or games. That's depending on which dictionary you look in, it will be something to the tune of those words. So an everyday athlete, this is our strength matters definition based on what the definition of an athlete is. A person who is skilled or trained to varying degrees 
in their everyday activities or ex exercise regime. I mean, varying degrees, that basically means that anybody who exercises regularly and has either very little skill or tons of skill is an everyday athlete. And so we're basically talking about that 20%, the 20% of people who care enough to be doing things regularly, but are at very different levels as to, uh, to their own um, ability and skill. So everyday athletes, um, just normal everyday people who exercise and care enough about their health to exercise because they understand that it will help them in their everyday life. Uh, we got um, one of my former clients and friends making his way up Penny Van Fan Dance there, Jacob's Ladder. Um, got my dearest grandmother, <laughs> two years old. Um, mental resilience is definitely her finest quality and look where it's got her. So definitely one of the finest qualities of complete athleticism, but we'll come on to that. Uh, a client doing a pistol squat with his, with his daughter on his shoulders. Um, another client that was about a week before she gave birth to her first child doing boxing and kettlebells. And in the bottom right corner, um, somebody I taught Indian clubs to really nice chap, professional poker player and, um, loves to loves Indian clubs because they he understands the, the the freedom of movement that it gives his whole upper body anyway it's, so, it's, yeah. so Phil if you just go back a slide very quickly before we go on to the scale but look like this is again we're talking about population 0.001 percent of the world's population are elite athletes yet everybody is focused on working with the elite everyone wants to become elite yet not everyone's willing to put in the work to become elite yeah. So what we're, what we're trying to get with here now is to understand that we can learn so much from the elite and that's great. However, what we can learn and how it's practical and applicable to everyday life for your own training, for how you train clients, is two separate things. So what we need to start working with and, and understand that training the everyday athlete is completely different to training the elite. But we can take the best bits from that and apply it to the system and understand here. But the focus and the depth and the attention is that Everybody is an everyday athlete, okay? Some people just don't know it yet. But we need to get away from the mindset of thinking people are elite and athletic to get to the point of where's the baseline? Are people fit for the game of life? And that's what we're trying to talk about and get towards mm -hmm. with what we're talking about is the everyday athlete. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Thanks, Phil. So, scale of athleticism. If we scale athleticism from zero to ten and put the sedentary couch commandos that make up 60% of the population, give them a score of zero. The Usain Bolts and the elite professional athletes will give them a nine or a 10. On this scale, I, I, I think, and it's my opinion that the people who sit in the 20% who do a little bit of exercise, but not enough to be classed as enough, I give them a score of, they're, they're, they're on the scale, but I'll give them a one or a two. Everyday athletes on this scale would score kind of a three to an eight out of 10 on athleticism. So it's kind of our job to help people get from that three up to the best form of athleticism that they can possibly get to, up to an eight, which in my opinion, anybody can do of any age with smart training principles. So where do every athletes fit into the population? It's kind of just um, put, ties it all together. Um, so 60% sedentary, 20% um, pre-athletic. The other 20%, so one in every five adults, we perceive to be everyday athletes. And then in that, you've got the 0.01% of people who are nine to 10 who are elite athlete, athletic. So if, if anyone's questioning our like our percentages, um, we're, you know, we're talking, yeah. you know, rounding figures up here because the, the fact of the elite is so tiny in comparison to the rest of the population. Yeah. So what is athleticism? We've, uh, we've gone to a lot of detail on this and we've looked at the history of athleticism, all the components that make up complete fitness. If you ask a different body or education system, you'll get a slightly different answer. But in terms of for, for training the everyday athlete, um, for strength matters, we've 
come up with these 10. So one to five, in no particular order. We'll go into these in a little bit more detail. Strength, speed, power, stability, and mobility. Cardiovascular capacity, mental resilience, agility, balance and coordination, and endurance. Um, so we're going to go into these in a little bit more detail, and you're going to get an opportunity to self-assess. So if you get a pen and paper, um, so quickly, if you're just sitting there and you want to have a go to self-assessment, if you just grab a pen and paper and rate your own athleticism. So we're going to start with strength. So Phil, just, just quickly before we go back, if you can pull it back one more thing here now. Um, like before we go into the self-assessment, I just want to give a bit more time so you can get a bit of pen and paper and we, we do this completely. Now, you have no idea how much time and effort and debate, emails, phone calls, video calls over the last three months we've had about working and coming down to these 10 components. And it's been a lot. There's been an awful lot. We haven't just randomly come up with these, these details. Um, one of the key things and one of the reasons we're talking about athleticism more than anything is that we all know that strength is something that we lose as we age. We know that it's a never ending battle. It's been documented. And everyone talks about it. But what we're seeing more and more is that these components of athleticism are being lost as well. You know, it was there was a couple of things that really stood out to me before Christmas um, when I was walking down the street. And I was it was just an average high street in Australia. And the number of people between the ages of 20 and 60 who were shuffling along, just plodding along, I think is the best way to describe it, was incredible. They were so unathletic. And as a population and as a, as a nation almost, you know, it was quite sad to see. So it got us really thinking about the fact that, well, we need to see everybody as being athletic. We need to help people here because it adds to the quality of life whether it's walking, getting up and down stairs, carrying, shopping, groceries, you name it. This is, what we're what this is why we're talking about athleticism and why it's so important. We're trying to stop and reverse the aging process, I think, is the, is the, is the best way. We want to or at least slow it down to some degree. Our motto behind the scenes here is we, 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 we're all about living to 100. That's, that's our goal. That's our aim. And this is what we want to try and get across to people in our training. It's about living to 100 and not just getting through the next day of how much weight you put on the bar. That's our long-term goal. So our training plan is, and this idea of athleticism, we want this to carry over to everyday life and to lead, you know, to the ripe old ages. How old is your grandma again, Phil? 92. 92. And above and beyond. And I think in coming upcoming webinars and podcasts and things as well, you'll hear us starting talking about the blue zones in, in uh, throughout yeah. the world too. So stay tuned on that because that's fascinating stuff about yeah. this aging process. Anyway, that's hopefully you've got pens and paper now, but this is why we think athleticism is so important. It's about longevity and, and lifespan, basically. Yeah. So, all for number one, write strength on your piece of paper. Rate yourself out of 10. Imagine the strongest person in the world, they sit as a 10. How, how, well, do you rate the, yourself against not necessarily that person or, or maybe a 10 should be the strongest that you could possibly ever be rather than, you know, rather than having somebody at home who's in their maybe 60s rating themselves against one of the world's strongest men. It's probably always going to be down at a zero or one. <laughs> but maybe if you imagine the strongest that you could possibly ever be, that's your 10. How good are you at moving and carrying things? How good are you at producing force? Awesome. Power. <clears throat> Power is basically the ability to move your body fast and move things of mass, heavy objects fast. So can you explode into action? Are you quick at starting off the spot? Can you move quickly to get somewhere without risking pulling something or being injured? Can you leap? and jump and bang like a cat or could you toss or throw a heavy sandbag or a keg of beer that's power speed once you get going doesn't necessarily mean how fast how fast you can actually get going but once you've started and got up to a decent speed with thinking running thinking i guess maybe cycling rowing 
can you repeat that movement pattern over and over and over fast? Are you fast? Agility. Agility basically means the ability to move from one movement pattern to another in a coordinated, athletic, nimble, supple manner. So are you nimble on your feet? Do you trip over things easily? Can you move in easily into any position? And remember, everybody, just keep keep rating yourself out of 10. This is creating a, your own personal scorecard. And we'll explain what you do with that scorecard in a second. But keep, you know, writing down, write strength, four out of 10, whatever you, wherever you're sitting. But do it for each of these as we're going down, because this is creating your own blueprint and your own scorecard to create a very simple self-assessment tool that, yes, we're taking a bit longer to explain, but can be done theoretically in a couple of minutes. Yeah. Um, endurance. So if you walk everywhere, um, former client of mine, she walked everywhere in London. She wouldn't take public transport anywhere. She spent three to four hours a day walking. I'd give her an endurance rating of, you know, out of 10, I'd give her an eight or a nine. Um, so when you get going on something, can you keep it up for a long time? How is your endurance? Cardiovascular capacity. That's that's basically your VO2. That's um, how efficient your heart and lungs are at delivering oxygen to the working muscles. Do you get out of breath easily? Do you feel the heartbeat pump out of your neck when you walk upstairs? Or is it never really an issue? Balance and coordination. Now, as a standard test, I'm going to be writing about this soon for the blog, but all I'm going to just make this statement, all able-bodied humans in the world should be able to close their eyes and balance on one leg for 30 seconds. And that is not asking too much. Anybody can do it with some practice, um, but as a base level of balance, that's where you should be. Um, so anyway, are, are you, how do you rate your own balance without going through that test? Maybe you can test afterwards. Um, is your balance and coordination good? Is your hand-eye coordination good? Stability, that means, so let's say, for instance, you go and bend over and pick something up. Are you proprioceptively aware enough to maintain a, a neutral spine as you bend over and pick something up? So you put that flexion and rotation through the, the lumbar. Can you control your movement? If you're a hypermobile person, then normally people who have a huge range of motion in their joints, like ballerinas, they score pretty low on stability because they can't, they, they go way over where they should do. Um, yeah, does your back bend when you lift things? Mobility. There's a difference between mobility and flexibility. We'll go into that in more detail at a later date, but are you flexible? Mental resilience. We used to call it mental toughness, but we didn't want to make it sound like tough is a bit of a intimidating word. How are you with discomfort? If the going gets tough, will you just carry on regardless? How much fight do you have in you? So you should now have a score. Uh, you should have 10 scores in front of you. Um, the whole point of this is what you'll naturally do when it comes to your own training, life, or anything, you'll always naturally default towards the aspects that you're already good at. For instance, I'm an endurance and cardiovascular guy, and I will jump at the chance to do anything that involves endurance or cardiovascular. If, any, if anything involves strength, speed, and power, I'm like, mm, yeah, yeah, don't really, I don't, I never really appreciate it until recently when I came across this whole concept of working on your weaknesses, which has kind of been bubbling away for some time. And actually working on power by doing sprinting and throwing heavy things has helped everything, getting stronger everywhere. So the, the point of this is so that you can identify your weaknesses and make the whole longer. You're only as strong as your weakest link. And Phil, it's interesting you say that thing because I'm the complete opposite with my training. I'm more of a power strength speed guy, I always have been. And that's kind of where I want to default to. I want to do the sprinting. I want to do in so endurance. 
I, I can talk about mobility and flexibility. That's one of my biggest weaknesses as well. But endurance has been something that's been lacking for a long time. So what I've been doing over the past, say, couple of months is really focusing on my endurance and building my baseline endurance up. So for those who are like, you'll hear more again from what I for my own journey in the next couple of months, some blog posts and stuff like that. But what I've managed to do is I've, I'm creating an endurance level. Phil talked about walking. I'm now reaching 10 kilometers a day by walking in my daily life, I'm not changing anything. I'm still working out, doing, doing workouts as well, but I'm building a baseline endurance of walking 10 kilometers a day. The carryover effect that is having onto everything else is huge, including you. Know, and I'm focusing on my rowing as well, and actually doing Phil's rowing program currently. And it's having a huge carryover effect in my everyday life and health. I can't emphasize it enough by just focusing on this and honing in on my weakness, which is endurance and I'd say mobility, flexibility and balance and coordination, which is interesting. Um, it's really making a big difference to me. So really focus on these weaknesses, look at them with an open mind and start to understand it. Yes, there's a bunch of other assessments we can go down afterwards, but we're creating a baseline standard for you to think about, oh, this, these are my weaknesses. Okay. Yes, I need to do other things, but these are my weaknesses. Yeah. I'm going to so, Phil, Phil's, Phil's jumping back over there. The human body was born to walk. For those of you who are in the industry, this is a bit of a complex read, but really good. So, yeah, the, everything works better in the body when the human body does what it's developed and designed to do over the course of hundreds of thousands of years of evolution, we walk and we're supposed to walk every day. If we don't, bad things start happening. Awesome. Anyway, so hopefully you've now got your scores, you've written down your scores in a bit of paper. We've gone into depth in it, but you know, Phil, let's give an example. Okay, so that's mine. <clears throat> um, I just, Scores out of 10, average, mobility, stability, balance, I think is pretty good, having been balancing on one leg, brushing my teeth daily. Mental resilience, needed a lot of that to join the Royal Marines. But like I said, strength and power are definitely the weakest and something I need to work on. And I, I having been working on that for months now, everything else is getting better. Awesome. Like I said, you know, and again, this is what we're working on behind the scenes. We actually create a simple tool that you can plot your actually own numbers into it, so it can create a graph like this for you. So this is, you know, we're, this is things that we're working on behind the scenes to make this super simple for you to help to you to assess your own strengths and weaknesses. So as I said, Phil's, you can see clearly from the graph here below the fives, are strength and power. If you're looking at the same here, if I did the same thing, you know, I'd be looking at mobility. I'd be looking at endurance and cardio, cardio capacity. Those are my, those will be my weaknesses in falling on down there. So, um, like I said, you know, we will create this tool. Or we'll get it out to you over the coming weeks. Yeah. Okay. Moving on. Well, any questions so far? Um, Sarah has missed part of this. Uh, unfortunately, she's she missed the part of how to rate your own athleticism. Sarah, in a very quick nutshell, you take the ten components of athleticism. And what you want to do is you want to score yourself out of 10 for each of them. So score yourself one to 10. Let's take strength, for example. Are you strong? Do you think you're strong? Therefore, you, you know, if you think you are super strong, you give yourself an eight maybe. But if you think you're actually weak in comparison, you know, give yourself a one or a two. And that's just a very quick in a nutshell. We haven't got time to go back into it on this webinar, but it, there will be a recording of this and you can watch it back and replay it afterwards. Okay. Any other questions? Let me just have a quick look on Facebook, Phil. Make sure no one's questioning on Facebook. Um, we have no, no questions on Facebook, just a couple of likes. Carry on. So how should the everyday athlete train? We're going to go into programming at a later date. Two weeks today, I'm going to show you how you can make your own enjoyment program that will tick all the boxes of human movement. But, um, so when we're thinking about program design, when we're thinking about how your body should be moving, it is important to identify or it helps to identify different movement patterns that the human should make. And we've identified seven. Now, 
this before I go into these, in fact, we'll go into them first and then I'll explain where they came from. Um, so number one, probably the most important, locomotion, how to move your body. Squat, that's where your knees and your hips bend to the same degree and you squat down. Hinge, that's where most of the action, that's where there's not much bending in the knee, but you bend over where most of the movement comes from the hip. Rotation, we're talking about ankles, hips, and thoracic spine, all three rotate to create movement. Anti-rotation, otherwise known as resisting movement, we're specifically talking about the spine here and how you can lock in your spine to create force from one arm to the opposite leg and vice versa. And basically just to create any kind of force, you, you need that anti-rotation. Push, pushing things with your upper body, pulling things with your upper body in, in all planes. Now, people have split down human movement for decades. We don't think ours is any better. We just, this is again, one of these things that have been, has been a conversation behind the scenes in Strength Matters for months. And this is basically what we came up with. This is, I'm, I'm gonna, thank the good work of people like Paul Check, Dan John. Uh, a lot of the information came from my researching all of their life's work and just put a few other bits and bobs in of our own. And it's, it's interesting so because this, this ties in because like, again, like as Phil said, there's no right or there's no wrong, but this, the everyday athlete is the ethos of strength matters. We're talking about the everyday athlete and this is what we feel are the most important components of the everyday athlete. And one of the big things we saw was that the lack of locomotion, the importance to move. There's a lot of people who are sedentary and a lot of people standing still, but are doing the same thing with their training as well. It's the ability to move as well as applying everything else and the rotate, anti-rotate. The number of people in, you know, feel free to comment below or on Facebook if you've ever experienced this. I talk, I call it the, the tea bag effect. And I, now for people who are listening into this, where this comes from is that I, I've heard people say to me, oh, my training is great, this is awesome, I'm feeling great. But then I go home a few hours later, I drop a tea bag on the floor, I go to pick it up, snap, my back goes. Yeah. I've heard that so many times from people dropping a spoon on the floor, from so many other things. You know, and the point is that we need to train all planes of motion. The everyday athlete is becoming a better human being, it's becoming more athletic and living towards 100. And these are the seven components that we feel are vital to help you achieve that. So this is just our take on the seven human movements. No right or wrong from others. It, it just, it's just based on where you want to go and what your ethos is and what you're trying to achieve. Yeah. So nice one, Phil. We'll just go into these in not so much detail. You could make an entire webinar on each one of these, but just to kind of briefly go through it. Locomotion basically means moving your body. When the human body moves, it moves in a contralateral fashion generally. So left shoulder working with right hip, left limb working with right limb and vice versa. That's why when you walk, when your right leg goes forward, your left hand goes forward. So real life movements that involve locomotion, creeping like a baby, just creeping along the floor, then developing into crawling, rolling around on the floor. All of these real life movements, if you lived a life that wasn't chair bound and it wasn't didn't involve you sitting behind a desk for 10 to 12 hours a day or sitting on the couch or sitting in the car all of these should already be in your life and you shouldn't actually have to train to um to increase longevity and athleticism training is basically there because we don't do all of these things but i, I hope that you can take away from this that if you I've highlighted some of these real life movements and these are, in my opinion, the offer the biggest bang for your buck. So if you take those five highlighted real life movements and just did a little bit of that every day, um, I'm not saying everybody should go out and start sprinting because they're not ready for that yet. Um, <clears throat> uh, just, I'm gonna touch on that quickly. I'm gonna go back to the, um, the 10 components of athleticism is absolutely essential to establish a base of mobility, stability, and balance first. 
Those are kind of the master qualities for athleticism. If you haven't reached a really basic level of flexibility, mobility, the ability to control your body, so that stability and balance, can you pass the eyes closed on one leg test? Then you shouldn't really be lifting up heavy weights or moving fast yet. But when you've got that base of movement, then you can add load, and then you can add speed. So anyway, provided you have the strength to sprint, um, then I would put uh, these five into your daily life. Moving on, I'm not going to spend this much time on each one. Additional training exercise. So locomotion exercise, you can pick up something, grab it, and carry it. And so go, basically going for a walk with something heavy in one hand would be amazing. Brilliant for lighting up your core. Crawling by pulling or pushing a train, pulling or pushing a sled. We got those three. Anyway, moving. Like I said, we can spend an entire hour on just locomotion alone easily. I could write an entire book on it, but so I'm just going to go through and give you just a summary of what each one is. The squat. The squat is probably the exercise or the movement that should be done most every day. Well, I know take locomotion off. Next is a squat. We should be sitting in squat positions. We should be going to the toilet in squat positions, as they'll do in Afghanistan. And they'll sit around in these positions for hours. Um, so anyway, real life movements. Rocking on the floor, that means hands and knees on the floor, rocking back and forth. That's basically a squat pattern. Um, sit down and do a squat just to take a rest. So the next time you consider sitting on a public bench, just try and squat. I do. I get some funny looks and sometimes people ask me, are you okay? Uh, <laughs> so, um, you can squat to eat, as also Casey and I do on our living room floor, much to our dog's delight. Um, anyway, moving on, additional training exercises. Something that really helps your squat pattern is a face-to-wall squat. It means have something in, right in front of you, hands out to the side and squat all the way down. That stops your head jamming forwards. If you want to work your thoracic spine, you can put your hands up in the air. But anyway, that's move. That's going on a bit, bit too technical. Um, we'll come back to the highlighted exercises, but the, the, the highlighted exercises are the ones that, in my opinion, if you did those, then you'd be pretty good and they would translate to everything else that you do. And it's, it's the important thing as well. It's like what we're saying is that we're giving these examples and it is, you know, this is about the everyday athlete. Please remember, we're not going for elite performance here. We've got to build a baseline first. We've got to think about the, the life and times of an everyday athlete, the everyday human. Uh, what we're saying is not saying anything's bad or anything's good here. What we're thinking, saying is these are the best bang for your buck exercises that you can use. That are safe. The number one goal here is not to injure people. Yeah. And, you know, what we're talking about is getting people ready here. So face the wall squats, Cossack lunges, goblet squats. They're a lot safer than getting someone on a barbell front squat or zercher squat to begin with. OK, we're not saying we don't do these exercises. We love those exercises, but it's about earning the right to get to them and yeah. allowing us to develop the whole program and think about these things first. Let's work on a system to get to here. And that's where we'll start talking about the continuums of, say, the squat of where people fit in. And yeah. you'll learn more about these in the coming weeks. Yeah. We're really excited about this because that's another thing we're putting together in like a, a highly formalized training plan solution. Yeah, the, each of these movements sits, like James just said, sits on a continuum. And every able-bodied person of any age across the world can fit somewhere on this continuum. And with daily practice, they'll be able to work up and up and up. I'm not saying that Olympic snatching is a possibility for everybody is absolutely not i'll never be able to do them so i don't have the mobility available in my thoracic spine but the, the point of the continuums is that anybody can fit anywhere and move up but we'll come to the continuums absolutely soon the hinge very similar to a squat you get a lot of movement from the hip but not much from the knee so basically you should be hinging day to day Real life movements, every time you bend to pick something up. Whenever you lunge, if, so the, the lunge is actually quite a complicated matter. It depends on what the upper body is doing, what the arm is doing, 
whether the lunge either fits into the squat or the hinge family. When did you get up off the floor? The hinge fits into it, lifting up furniture and shopping. And I put prayer on there. It's the Muslim prayer position is there's a lot of hinging that goes on there. Um, additional training exercises. Uh, there we go. Those the green ones again, they're the ones that, in my opinion, will give you the biggest bang for buck if you have the, the skill to do them. But we'll come to these another time. That's, yeah, exactly. That's the thing. So looking, looking at the thing. Look, look at notice what we've put down here: the single leg hinges, the single leg deadlift, you know, suitcase deadlift. A lot of a lot of unilateral stuff going on there um, with the hinging pad for the biggest bang for your buck. Because yeah, we work in certain planes of motion, and this is where we we're, we're leading towards all of this. Um, there's a lot of fun stuff you can do here. There's a lot of bang for your buck exercises. But if you just notice from there, we look at the additional training exercises from the hinges. Just take note of the single leg, single arm stuff. Yeah. Rotate. So like I said, that means that your body is moving because rotation is driven through your ankle and or your hip and or your thoracic spine. So a rotational force is driven through the body. In a everyday life, these should be part of your life and or involve a lot of rotation. So rolling, crawling, twist, grab, reach, getting up off the floor, walk, run, sprint, climb, swim, throw, punch, kick. If anyone's wondering what walking is about that here, I'll, I'll, this is one of the best drills that Perry Nicholson uh, shared with a couple of years ago. I love it. I still use it. If I'm still feeling slightly stiff as I'm walking or rotating. I try to avoid it in public places. But what I tend to do is as I'm walking, I take my opposite hand and use my finger and point to the opposite foot. So as I'm walking, I'm like doing like a John Travolta, like hip hinge type walk. Nice. It feels great on your thoracic spine. It feels great. You feel the rotation. Because as Perry says, you need to rotate as you walk. Most people are so stiff and rigid that marching in place, everything's going forward. But next time you're walking, literally as you're walking, as, you, as your front foot comes forward, take your opposite hand and point across the body, across the, across the midline and keep doing it as you're walking along and tell me how your hips and how your T-spine feels as you're doing it. And that's what we mean by rotate when we're walking. And, and if you want to, seems we're going to geek on about what we can do when we're walking, if you want to take it to the next level, just to go really crazy, you could touch your right elbow to your opposite knee, take a step and carry on walking like that. So just, you wouldn't do that for your whole journey, but well, you could. But uh, anyway, it's no, it's honestly, it's, it's great. You know, if we're talking about cross, doing that whole cross core pattern, the guys at Original Strength who introduced me to that whole concept, my active recovery now, if I'm saying I'm doing a set of kettlebell swings or a set of deadlifts, my active recovery is almost 10 series of cross crawls. It feels great. It feels really good and it does press reset as the guys from Original Strength said. Anyway, that's a slight geek on again. Me and Phil getting excited, too excited. Next, anti rotate. We specifically, rotation basically meant um, the creating rotation through the ankle, the hip, and the spine, and the thoracic spine. Anti-rotation basically means resisting all movement in the lumbar and thoracic spine. The reason we would do that is because a neutral spine transmits force a lot better than a flexed or a not untense or a um, twisted spine. So if you were to say, pick something heavy up in your right hand, you need to maintain that anti-rotation so that the force is transmitted down through into the opposite leg and you don't injure your back when you do it. Um, there's a ton of day-to-day -day movements that involve anti-rotation. So let's say real life movements, balancing one leg, you could argue whether that actually fits into a normal real life movement or not. Pushing and pulling on something with one arm, carry something with one arm. So let's say carrying a bag of shopping. Your torso requires the ability to resist bending over to one side, just basically to stay upright while you carry it. Lifting up something heavy, opening a heavy door. Additional training exercises, there are tons for anti-rotation. We're gonna go into this, like I say, in a lot more detail. Um, and how you can work in anti-rotation 
into your uh, training. Single leg deadlift, brilliant suitcase deadlift. Excellent. The rip trainer, that's Perry Nicholson's favorite. Uh, anyway, moving on. But like I said, you, with, with, with giving you all these additional training as, as an example and then as a flavor. Now, the beauty of it is how we put this, these things together, like how we can give examples and keep people interested, keep people activated and active and moving along alongside all these things. And please, if you're thinking, oh my God, there's a lot of exercises, how do I do all of these in one go? You're not going to. Okay, what we're trying to give you is an example of what the possibilities and what these exercises are. We will cover programming, we will cover sample workouts and specific case studies over the coming months. And in fact, for the foreseeable future, because we know this is a very complex area. Most people have different injuries, different problems, different issues, different goals. We know that and we're going to help you understand that a lot better and put this all together. So there is a system. We are just giving an overview of what these things are, the seven movements and the 10 components of athleticism. We will go into the actual putting the things together at a later date. Okay, push. Real life movements that involve pushing, pushing open a heavy door, getting up off the floor, putting a heavy bowl into the kitchen cupboard, um, putting heavy suitcase into the luggage, overhead luggage. Hey, that, that, that'll be me in a few hours. Yeah, and Casey. Um, and building shelter. So, uh, of course, you all build your own shelter, right? <laughs> Additional training exercises involve pushing. Now, this is something that I would, I'm going to suggest that maybe my mum starts with. And that is just putting a one hand on a wall, letting yourself down slowly, and then pressing back up again. And if you, because she's using one hand, then that's also working anti-rotation because otherwise you would flop down. Uh, moving on then, so that, that would be kind of the lower end of the, the push continuum, whereas at the far end, the one arm, one leg push up for those more advanced everyday athletes who are on a path, uh, even the, the one arm, one leg push up, everything has a progression. Absolutely everything has a progression. If your goal is to be able to do a push up, with your left hand on the floor and your right foot, vast majority of people out there can do it just by following the step-by-step -step progression to get there. Um, so anyway, if, if and in doing that, then you will be that that will have a very strong crossover to everything else. Pull, still with your upper body, um, everyday movements, pulling open a heavy door, picking something up, moving down to the more more advanced ones, moving furniture. I helped a friend move something heavy yesterday. I was like, yeah, this is awesome. I'm <laughs> pushing and pulling without having to go to the gym and do it. Um, additional training exercises. Here we are. Two hands any hand at the bottom, because that's kind of the most technical grip balls at the top. So again, um, if mum is watching, I'm sorry to keep using you, mum. But to, uh, to the bottom end of the scale of the continuum. I mentioned the continuum that everybody can start on. Right on the one end, grip balls or a grip trainer, something to get the grip moving. The hands have a very strong neuro neurological connection to the shoulder and to the hip. If you get the, the hands strong and moving, then everything else switches on. Moving on. Like I said, so Phil, if you go back to the pool mm -hmm. size here now, again, look, we've just covered a very quick 40,000 foot overview of the seven human movements. We've given you examples of real life movements, examples of additional training exercises. Please, if you're thinking, oh my God, where do I start? What do I do? Where do, where do I fit this all in? How can I do it for my own training? How can I do it here? Don't panic. Uh, as, as if anyone ever, has ever watched, um, oh, what's the TV show, Mr. Mandarin? Um, don't panic, don't panic, Dad's Army. Exactly, Dad's Army. That's the one from the UK. Google it. Google, Google Mr. Mannering from Dad's Army. Don't panic, Mr. Mannering. That's my phrase. That's the line of you know, thought process for you to use here on this thing. Okay, this is just an overview, understanding of the concepts of what is the ultimate everyday athlete. How do you become the everyday athlete? You need to understand this basis first. This is for trainers, this is for coaches, this is for people at home who just want to work out, okay, and understanding. 
we are all everyday athletes. Even elite athletes will transition back into becoming everyday athletes. We guarantee you that because that's what happens, okay? Life at the elite is, is, is short-lived, I can assure you that. And the hardest thing is transitioning back into it. Phil, from Phil's experience in the military, you know, he was working very hard, pushing his, his body to the limits on most days and most training sessions. He had to retrain himself afterwards. Isn't that right, Phil? Yeah. It, and get him, and get him right. back into life. Yeah. The, uh, the military training mindset, especially with kind of elite advanced military, your training goes to war. Um, in, in a war situation, you need to ignore pain and you need to just go on regardless, no matter what your body's telling you to, because otherwise people might die around you. The problem is, is when military people apply that mindset to training, where you must work, 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 work without listening to my body and slowing down when my body tells me to and working through pain barriers. So, um, yeah, that's another topic coming up in the mental resilience section. Um, but yeah, it's really important to listen to your body and not push yourself to oblivion every time you go training. Exactly. And that, that's from both. But like I said, you know, Phil, Phil's background is very, very military based. Uh, mine is from, from the first responders based, you know, police, which is very similar, different, but similar, um, where it's exactly the same thing. You push yourself to failure and you keep going, you keep going, you keep going. Sadly, in real life, it doesn't work out. OK, your body ages. We're aging. We have to adapt and train accordingly. And like I said, if I can't say this, I can't say this enough on any of these webinars. And I'll keep repeating myself. Our goal is to live to 100. OK, if our goal is to live to 100, we need to train accordingly and train with the mindset of doing that. It's little and often over the long haul with intelligent training systems and solutions and putting it all together. You can't always chase the weight. It's a fun thing to do. Trust me, we know we get that. However, we've got to do it accordingly and work out where it fits in with your goals, your lifestyle, life balance, everything coming into one. And that's what we're trying to get towards. I use the word holistic because it is we want this whole lifestyle holistic approach to training where it goes beyond the training. It goes beyond just going in and lifting heavy weights. That stuff's fun. So is climbing mountains. So is going paddleboarding. So is going kayaking, snowboarding, all this other stuff that's out there in life, we want you to enjoy to the best of your ability. And a phrase that Phil used last week on the webinar, and that he, we spoke about in depth behind the scenes, is that Nick Gill, the, um, the strength and conditioning coach for the All Blacks, for the All Blacks are the um, professional rugby team in New Zealand, the national team that has, has the highest win rate in the world, bar none. Um, Phil, explain to what, what Nick, Nick said about being battle ready. Uh, I just asked him about um, how he periodizes his training with his rugby players and how he makes sure that the, uh, the, the players are psychologically ready to basically go into battle every week and how they periodize that because periodization is something that a lot of coaches kind of live around. And he basically said that period periodization just doesn't exist. They have to perform to their best ability on a weekly basis. Um, so they just have to be battle ready all the time. And that was definitely the case in the Marines as well. And I think when it comes to everyday people with their everyday training, everyday people have things that come up in their lives that offer its own kind of periodization, its own fluctuations. So, you know, a business trip would come up that gets in the way of a program an illness sets in, something, a life occurrence gets in the way. So everyday athlete programming doesn't really involve, am I going off point? It doesn't no, no, this is great. I'm going to tie in as well very quickly because I've got a business trip coming up to Singapore today, which I'm having to leave shortly for. Yeah. So, you know, like power, um, periodization comes in brilliantly when there's a specific goal, like a power meet or a triathlon or something that, your body has to peak for to perform well so say periodization works really well with performance i love writing periodized training programs i love it it's an art but um i just don't think it's uh, this is my opinion and the opinion of many others that i've had this conversation with periodization just doesn't come into everyday people because you you have to perform your everyday athleticism 
you, you know, you could have to save your own life at any time. You could have to pick something up any time. So, um, yeah. It's, it's, it's true. And you could talk about training plans and training programs. For anyone who knows me, they will know how much travel I'm doing. Like I'm about to take a trip to Singapore today and then on to London before coming back, all in the space of two to three weeks. If I have a set training plan that I'm meant to be doing right now for that two to three week period, how demoralizing is it when I hit and I'm suffering from jet lag, how I won't be able to achieve certain hits and numbers. In fact, I'm increasing my risk of injury. If I'm on a deadlift training plan and I need to hit certain numbers on this progression and this periodization program, if I'm pulling and I'm tired, I'm jet lagged, it has a huge knock on effect, not just for the two to three weeks I'm traveling, but for when I return as well. So there's so many things people, people need to understand. That, and this is where my mindset has changed. It's the psychology of these, these training programs as well. Training to be battle ready, training for everyday life is very different. Uh, and this is what we're trying to get across to people and understand and help them. We're not saying periodization is wrong. We're not saying that at all. We understand it. We, we get it. We think it's vital for certain needs. But when it comes to the everyday athlete, it's about being ready for everyday life and putting it all together. Yeah. Phil, like I said, I think, you know, with all the with some questions coming in and people asking certain things, I think it's, it's a good time now as we start to tie it all together. Yeah. Get me, I'll, I'll do a little recap. Correct me if I'm wrong, um, and hopefully it's a help for people to understand. So everybody out there listening, we're talking about the everyday athlete and programming and creating workouts for the everyday athlete. That could be you, that could be for clients. We believe that athleticism is very, very important. It makes up complete fitness. We feel there are 10 components of, of complete athleticism or complete fitness. And we've gone through those 10 components in depth today, and you've rated yourself through those one to 10 and giving yourself a little scorecard. Hopefully you've identified your own weaknesses and that's something you need to think about and start to apply and put into your own program design. We will help you with that in the coming weeks. But what we want to go away with is understand is that you need to understand the 10 components of athleticism. We're not asking you to recite them and know them off the top of your head and like be able to tell us straight away. But what we will ask you to go through and understand is the seven fundamental human movements because we feel every training plan or every training goal or whatever you're training for needs to be focused around those seven human movements with an understanding of the 10 components of athleticism and that's how you start to piece things together and create your best workouts and your best training plans yeah is that, is that a fair way to sum it up phil and put it all together yeah so yeah definitely um as promised right at the start I said that I'd leave you some tips that you can, that will help you. So just in my opinion, if you were to do these things every day, then you wouldn't really need much of a training program just for your own longevity. Um, I'd maybe take a screenshot of this. If you don't know what a rock is, then just look up rocking or original strength rocking, original strength rolling. Um, I've put in, am I allowed to say this, James, squat for a code brown? <laughs> we'll let people Google that themselves, but that's the best way to describe it. And it actually, is, it's a very serious issue here in Brisbane. If anyone noticed, and you go to any public toilet here in Brisbane, and they actually have a look, they'll see signs for certain things. And that is, you can't stand on the toilet. So there you go. Yeah, because Australians are like a lot more advanced than a lot of places in the world when it comes to exercise minded. A, a client of mine went to Sydney once and saw everybody crawling. He's like, Phil, this thing you've been getting me doing for the last five years, everyone's already doing it in, in Sydney. It's a thing. Everybody crawls. Like, well, yeah, probably the rest of the world will catch up in another five or ten years. You know, anyway, so take those, do those every day, bounce on one leg when you're brushing your teeth in the morning, bounce on the other leg when you're brushing your teeth in the evening. Avoid chairs at all costs because they, in the words of the great Perry Nicholson, chairs kill your ass, your so ass, and your soul. Death yep. of the chair. <laughs> and exactly. Again, I'm not going to go through these. It's just to help tie it up. In my opinion of working in the industry and being a exercise geek for most of my life, if you just did these things in the gym, 
and nothing else, you'd be in a very good state. And you'd and probably why. And for those wondering how, how can I write all this down, don't worry, there's going to be a replay of this. I would recommend taking a screenshot on your screenshot on your phone, screenshot from your desktop if you're watching anywhere very quickly. Like I said, the replay will be available. It'll be up on Facebook later today after the live, Facebook live feed comes on and will be available on the hub and on the, on the desktops and on the websites as well. So don't worry if you can't write all this down. It will be available in the coming hours, we promise. Yeah. So just to finish off then, that's us. Thanks for watching. We are doing a lot of work at the moment to develop a programming tool for the everyday athlete. Um, we are tons of blogs and content coming out. I have the pleasure and the honor of working with some of the industry greats, people that I've been reading the books of and following for years. And now I get to actually speak to some of them on a weekly basis to help develop this whole thing um, and it's all coming out in the blogs and the magazine and James has managed to recently get the magazine on the on the um, app store so uh, it was a bit of a mission that took a long time a lot of pain but it's finally there and um, so it's now in the palm of your hand exactly like i said guys honestly if this is you know again phil thanks so much for joining us again today this week and sharing this and you know, each week we're, we're coming up with new things and we want to keep you guys at the, the forefront of what we're doing and what we're developing so like i said you know there's a lot of stuff coming on the blogs i highly recommend checking out our whiteboard wednesday uh which comes out every wednesday a little video that goes in more depth into certain topics and uh, ideas and concepts you know we've, we've we've recorded so many over the last few weeks and there's you'll be coming out regularly every wednesday so but like i said the main thing with the app is what people have been saying to us is that how do we get all this information quickly at the palm of our hand well of course it's an app most people have a smartphone these days so if you really, really want to be on the forefront of what's coming out be able to identify and find things very quickly i highly recommend getting the app for both on android and on apple um, that's where you can access most of the blogs, most of the videos. And like I said, if you really want the very best content that we have from our world leading experts and have some more insight into everything else that goes on with Strength Matters, we have the magazine. And you can jump on anytime you want to, you can download the app, get it today, and you can have a seven day free trial to have a look at it and see if it's right for you. Um, we love it. We're putting our best work on it. In fact, I'm waging war on the health and fitness industry in the form of magazines, because I don't think there's any magazine out there that gives sensible, long lasting advice. It's all about six pack abs and everything else. So you've heard it here now. I'm waging war on the health and fitness magazine industry. Anyway, thank you everyone for listening in. Uh, for Master Strength Matters, uh, for me personally, thank you, Phil, for being with us. Uh, it's been awesome. I uh, love doing these things. There'll be more of these to come. Uh, the replay will be up on Facebook. It will be up on the website so you can view it anytime and it will be available on the app. Phil, any parting words? Stay strong, homies. Sounds good to me. Uh, as we always say back in Wales, and again, going back to the whole Welsh theme, ciao for now, as they say in Shandau. Take care, everyone. Bye -bye. We'll speak to you all soon. Ta-da.